it's like intensely painful. And that's the reason why, you know, a lot of war journalists, for instance, they only do one, maybe two wars, right? Some like exceptional ones, they maybe do more, but no one actually has the emotional capacity to actually continuously uh, look at these things. So, um, and, and you know, it's also this question like, which I was thinking for quite some time, like unrelated to this, but in general, like can an image be like traumatizing? Can, can image actually be, uh, can seeing an image be damaging uh, to a person? And I think after past year, I can say that definitely yes. There are things that you see and they kind of like enter your psyche on like quite a deep uh, level. Which, but then how, like basically that's, that's what like a lot of theory deals with. Like what do we do with violence? What do we do with images of violence? Uh, how do we, uh, at like Susan Zontag's words, like look at the suffering of the other, right? And there is no, the, I think the issue is there is no, like I think, yeah, there is no direct answer to that. It was interesting, there was that, um, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago when um, that image of a dead baby on, washed off on the shore of probably mm. Turkey was published on the front pages of all the world media. It was a, an attempt to soften the public sentiment towards migrants uh, because mm. of the crisis in um, Syria. So, so that image makes you, or that story of that image makes you think about what you're saying in terms of the function of image. What can an image do? Can the image achieve something? So some, for someone who's interested or who studies or explores the visual uh, domain of our culture. I wonder, has this changed your work or has it changed what you value or what you're, or how you see visual culture? I think it's basically, uh, I, it's maybe not just about visual culture per se, uh, but I was thinking about this thing that like how basically, but there is a lot of horror going on in the world, right? And there are many ways to engage with this, right? So the obvious way is to engage, to try to alleviate whatever the like immediate, pain is like try to relieve it right mm -hmm. through various uh, things like in various uh, instances to like get engaged with whatever is the health issue the war issue the political uh, issue and try to solve it right and like try to or, or try to relieve uh, the pain that is in there that's one way but then what I realized recently is that there is this other way in which it's not you per se engage directly in a particular issue but you engage in building a world which is like sits as a counterbalance to that building it stronger right so in a sense what war is aimed at it's aimed to destroy culture and it's aimed to destroy peace and it's aimed to like destroy a sense of security out of which basically the whole like human a lot of human creativity comes out right so you can create this like other thing which strengthens the world which is not the troubled the the the, the let's say the issue itself, which does not like, uh, which does not, which only complements, I feel, all of the efforts of direct uh, uh, engagement, right? So example that I'm, uh, I'm thinking of is during World War II, 
Albert Hoffman, the chemist who synthesized LSD, basically what he did, he was uh, tripping in the Swiss Alps, right? And he wrote, he wrote LSD, My Troubled Child, where it's a book which collects his experiences with the substance and like his friends experiences with it and then somehow later on i think the whole like peace movement and the nuclear disarmament movement in the 60s and 70s right was highly connected to the uh, psychedelic culture so in a sense hoffman was not engaged in world war ii directly but somehow he created the substance which was literally associated with a peace movement later on. And apparently like the uh, nuclear disarmament movement, which apparently did achieve many things in those decades and decades to follow, that like in the 90s we signed these treaties that we stopped nuclear bomb testing uh, internationally, right? And there was this like symbolic, you know, like removal, removal of like, I don't know, like few warheads by each country, which obviously like didn't achieve its ultimate result, but I feel was uh, kind of like pointing mm -hmm. in the right direction. So what we're talking about is this connectivity of culture. So how, how did you, how did you end up being interested in architecture? That's a, that's a long one. <laughs> we have time. Yeah, we have time. Uh, I think it will link, I think it will link into the crisis of built environment that we see in Ukraine, but I think it's with obvious, for obvious reasons, but I think it's maybe just worth also just zooming out and um, yeah, just going to the, to the, to the very beginnings of, of your interest in architecture. So the story with architecture is kind of like, is a gradual story because up until some point in my life, it didn't really occur to me that uh, there is such an option. Um, I think I think one of the like early moments was we, I mean, part of it obviously came to me through photography because a lot of my photographic. Uh, practice is focused on urban environments and uh, the 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 physical spatial layout of things and like some I don't know random objects which just exist in space which came which came through this like observation of surroundings basically that's that was like one I think strain of it. Another one was connected uh, when I started Biblioteca and we, we, we were doing some, we organized some lectures with architects and I met some architects and I generally through running Biblioteca, I realized oh my God, like, that actually spaces carry so much power and they define so much, not, not necessarily, I think define is not the most precise word, they impact so much everything that's uh, uh, going on, which kind of like, yeah, which opened up my drive towards uh, architecture. And then uh, when I moved to London, I got a membership to a library and I was just like, you know, hanging out there once a week. Uh, and then I heard that AA is uh, digitizing the archives uh, and I emailed Ed and I, I basically, I got a job digitizing some like lantern slides with like architectural photographs and after doing it for about a year i realized that uh, actually i need to go to go study i need to like get get more serious uh, about it and i feel i feel extremely blessed to be at the a actually because i wouldn't really see myself in any other school that i know of at the moment uh, because I think it does 
this is the type of environment which does allow you to enter architecture from whatever background you're formal, like whatever is your whatever direction, yeah. Uh, uh, take on architecture, and I feel it's this school which is quite actively questioning what is architecture. Hmm. So you came into architecture through really interesting books. So one thing I really want to understand is, is whether your interest is in the book or in the library. Definitely in the library. Right, and why so? Uh, maybe, maybe it was at the beginning, it was kind of driven by books, but uh, I think it's important to, to be here specific that it was driven by interest in artist books and photography books, basically books which the main content of which is images. I was, I was kind of like fascinated by this uh, uh, concept because it really, I think it really manifests itself uh, as an object beyond being like a mere like carrier of the uh, of the content so like i guess that was the entry point but as i progressed uh, through my career uh, with libraries i realized that like library is a medium uh, in itself right and and uh, you see, the reading of books is actually not a necessary element uh, of a library because uh, there is this essay by Benjamin called Unpacking My Li Library, where he talks about that collectors don't read books, they just collect them. And he says, it might come as a surprise to someone outside of it, but it's not news at all to him, right? And there is this like whole like myriad in this book, uh, Man Without Qualities, there is this figure of a librarian who doesn't read books, right? And he's, he only reads the covers and the, uh, and the content of each book. And he's like confronted by this other person who says, but like, how come you are a librarian? But he says, well, that's precisely the point because he says, if I read any book in particular too much, I will lose the bigger picture. And he says, it's my role as a librarian. And interestingly, this position of a librarian has been like partly automated now. Right. What this person did is now done by a digital catalog where like you input, but still, but still somehow librarians still serve as guides to more ambiguous requests, which not necessarily can be like phrased uh, in like finite or like specific amount of words. But yeah, libraries is a topic. And then when I entered it, I realized that. A, for instance, if you look at past 70 years of history of museums, you see all sorts of experiments and like all sorts of curatorial decisions and like spatial innovation and architecture, like all sorts of things that happen with the museums in like fairly short uh, uh, period of time. And then somehow I don't, I think, I think now we're starting finally to enter this period where these things are being like seriously opened up for the conversation of uh, how library could operate and like how it could engage with people. It doesn't mean that existing models uh, are irrelevant. I think there are, there are a lot of good working models uh, for libraries, but it's that there is this possibility to to open it up. I think we can talk more about um, where a library can go as a space, but I feel before we do that, I would still want to take you back to the book. Mm. Um, 
because it does constitute a library. In it some does. And, and I think what was interesting, what you said is that the book is an object in itself. Um, mm -hmm. And in a way that has been the premise of the Biblioteca, the organization that you founded with a, a number of other collaborators. But um, when the book is object in itself, how is then the space of the book acknowledged through the space of the space, of, of the physical space? I'm just thinking of uh, an object in a gallery, mm. right? an artwork in a gallery. Mm. That it's different. Yes. Yeah. So there are multiple layers to that. So the most obvious, and if you look at libraries, right? It's yes, we say that library somehow is connected to a book. But then, for instance, we have record libraries, which contain records, but not books. And we still call them library, and they operate as libraries. And then we have film libraries, which contain film. And with film, it's like, it includes variety of media, right? From like physical, like film tape to like, to digital film and everything. And we still call it a library, right? So I think the essential difference, if we take, uh, uh, if we take a glass, right? And we put this glass into a gallery, right? What it does in a gallery, it's there to be displayed and then essentially to be sold. That's the idea that like what galleries do, they sell things essentially, right? If we put the same glass in the museum, that glass would have to be a part of some narrative of uh, displays of different types of glasses and glass blowing and uh, I don't know, like all sorts of liquids that you can put in the glass and so on. And then we put the same glass in the archive and it sits there to be preserved for as long as possible so that in the future, people who might want to find out about glass or glasses in the past, right? They can consult the archive, right? And then the library is the only place where you can actually come and drink from that glass, where things are to be used. And, and to me, it's like part of the fundamental difference between, and basically the same comes for the book, right? Usually when you see a book in the museum, it's like behind glass on a display on a very specific uh, page. It's not to be, it's not to be directly engaged with, right? Uh, and I think it's it's also this difference between the archive and the library because archive is there to preserve, but then archive has this uh, internal contradiction that on the one hand it's there to provide access to things, but the more things are access, the more they the, like the more people consult them, the more they degrade kind of like being in contradiction with the purpose of the archive to preserve. So with library, it's different because I think libraries acknowledge the fact that things degrade and things get damaged and things get lost. But that's, that can be written off by the fact that it's actually being accessed and used. That like someone, it's this, it's this moment of individual encounter of the content, which is in part uh, one of the focal, focal points for a library. So was this something that you thought about when you started Biblioteca, which the direct translation to English is library? <laughs> that's, that's apparently a funny joke, I still. I still think we've done pretty well. I think it changed a bit since we moved to London because in here it sounds like some like name, right? But when we were doing it in Kiev, it was actually... A library, yeah. But the, I mean, there is, there was like, uh, like 
uh, answering your first question, was there, uh, did I think about these things as book as an object, uh, uh, library compared to archive and museum and like everything? Uh, no, I came to Biblioteca totally intuitively and it's, it came later as I became like more and more seriously engaged with it and like started doing serious research on it that I can like theorize uh, about it. But the initial impulse behind it was completely uh, intuitive. What was that impulse? Uh, what was the impulse? Um, I, I really if, feel like- if you, take us, if you take us to Kiev, what, 2018 or when did I, it start? Uh, the, it start, I think the idea was like conceived late 2015, then it started like 2016. Okay. I mean, the idea was simple. I really needed one myself. I really like this, uh, the, the whole artist publishing world. And at the time, it's not only there was, there wasn't a decent library for that uh, in Kiev, there wasn't I think later on there came a few nice bookshops, but there wasn't really a good, like even like a good place to go like buy these things, right? Which I collected. Yeah, so it, it basically- you collected. So you collected them in the first place. Yeah, I collected and then I met, I, met, I, I can't say that at the time I had a huge collection. No, I just collected some things when I was like traveling. Um, maybe while I remember this, like maybe like a small relapse back when you say about the name uh, and the name Biblioteca, which means uh, uh, library, the idea behind it, if you name a specific project using a generic uh, word for it, there are basically the idea behind it that there are two things which are happening. On the one hand, you completely internalize uh, the entire weight of that word, word and you uh, completely engage with what it already carries and you build on top what has been already done with this notion or concept on the one hand. But then on the other hand, it's a way to influence language because for everyone who've been to this specific library, the word library means a slightly different way, which in a sense increases the possibility of this, of this concept, mm -hmm. like re-emerge or like enter the broader, uh, the broader beyond of library practices. So that's it. Yeah, how things started. Uh, yeah, so I had some books and I approached this photographer called Viktor Marushenko. He was running, he was basically like part of the scene in the like 70s and 80s when like the whole like Kharkiv school of photography occurred with like Boris Mihailov and like all of these people he was like friends with them and he was running a photography school and he had a really beautiful book collection and I figured that they don't they don't they don't do anything in there on Sundays mm -hmm. so I brought my books there there was like his books and we did the library as an event for a year every Sunday, it was like the event was that the library was open, right? Uh, and to my, like, uh, to our surprise, it was extremely, like, people loved it. It was, like, it was busy, and it was, like, full every Sunday, which kind of, like, uh, which indicated, like, this point of, like, huge cultural demand. And we did that for a year, and then there was this, art center opening called Plivka. And they invited us to do a library there. And they had this like full, like really powerful focus on music. 
mm -hmm. both like uh, like uh, progressive electronic music, but then also like academic, more like academic music, which was like extremely powerful. And they invited uh, like all sorts of uh, um, yeah electronic musicians and like artists. So there was like this music thing, and we would keep the library open for the till late, so like people would like wander in there like after a gig or something. And what they just pick the book off the shelf and look at it, and... or just hang around. That's that's part of my that's part of my point because library is not books. I mean, I like books. Books are important. There are nice books, right? But library is not books, right? And library is even like like not shelves and not tables. And library is not even a room. Library is this idea which binds books and people and space kind of like together. Because you can be in a library without like ever touching a book. And I think everyone did it. Can you be in a library, can a library exist without having any books in it? Uh, I think- There seems to be something about proximity to this um, thing. I would say I would say there couldn't be a library without a collection of whatever media, uh, uh, whatever media is there. So I think collection is the key uh, element of it, right? And like, yeah, biblioteca collects books. We like books. In part, it has to do with. That I think past decade has been an extremely exciting, the most extreme, like exciting time to collect artist publications because the scale at which things are being published has exploded. The amount of small publishers has also like multiplied uh, big time. The success of book fairs like off print the new york art book fair by uh, printed matter signifies that there is a huge cultural interest in it right and what i see is basically the necessity to capture this moment in form of a library because yes there are really good book fairs which do that Yes, there are really good bookshops which do that as well, right? But, uh, and there are some libraries which, institutional libraries which collect these things. But there are like series of questions to that uh, as well. So apparently the term artist book and library practice uh, was invented in London by, the, by Clive Philpott. He was a head librarian at the Chelsea School of Art. And he, in the late 60s, he started seeing these books when the whole artist publishing scene was occurring. He started seeing these books, which didn't fit into any existing library uh, uh, category, right? And that's the point where he realized the necessity to introduce, like basically, separate this book, these types of books as the category of their own, right? And then he moved to New York and he created the artist book collection in the Museum of Modern Art, which at the time was actually separate from the main library collection of MoMA, which kind of like indicates something about the material itself. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's uh, uh, still, uh, still the case there, but basically where I'm pointing to, it, and it's it has slightly to do so like what I'm what, what I'm talking about. There is a huge interest in these things, and I think interest compared to I don't know exhibitions, an interest comparable to like films and music and like all other. Uh, arts media, and I feel there is a lack of lack of like, serious recognition of that mm -hmm. uh, by libraries. I spoke last uh, time. I did the the first series of conversations. I did. Um, I spoke to Yusuf Hassan, who 
is the founder of Black Mass Publishing in New York, and he is a Black American artist himself. But he's also talking about, in a way, reclaiming the book format in the kind of post-colonial condition, where the book has perhaps been associated with uh, Western white supremacy, however you want to call it, or is at least seen as such by communities which don't see it as part of their own uh, set of tools. So there's maybe also something in that, uh, that the book is now being reclaimed as a device by, by people around the world. So I don't know if that's at any point coming to your thinking about what the Biblioteca does or what you do in terms of collecting books. I think there is this connection, uh, strong connection between the idea of a book and the idea of the positivist idea of knowledge, right? And like this knowledge being like, you know, somebody coming in and like playing it out for you. And like that, and then library also being the space which like adds up all of this uh, like knowledge and you know, there is a structure of a book. And I think I think what really like art is publishing did, it's kind of like slowly dismantling that, which I really like because all of a sudden uh, book doesn't, doesn't have to be consistent. It doesn't have to be from A to B to C. It can be like yeah. as random and as expressive uh, uh, as, as possible. So yes, I would agree, I would agree with the point that like book as a medium is now reestablishes uh, uh, itself in a sense that we observe the dismantling of this like rigid idea of what a book is. Mm. Mm. I'm interested in what you have said about library as an event. Mm. It's, um, this notion that a library is something that happens once a week, because I think that in itself is a very uh, different way of thinking about library and may well be a, an alternative way or, an, or a new perspective. Because again, library in the Western understanding of it is this marble building, it's this highly intellectual, uh, space highly focused and quiet right there is the quietness is a very important association but when you say event when you when you mention electronic music you're in a way questioning the the quietness the rigidity you know, the thing that I, uh, I realized recently that you know books are soft and thus they absorb sound really well that's like library spaces and like there is this whole uh, a question of like we have venues for uh, performance of live music starting from like uh, I don't know band playing a singer singing like whatever right we have plethora of different type of venues for uh, for live music right yet we don't really have we don't really have venues for recorded music. Whereas a lot of artists, they produce their music in studios, and that's basically their masterpiece. It's not what, what is performed live, but what is recorded in the studio, right? And there is actually like libraries used to have what's called listening rooms. And the idea was that you would like access when like records were not as common and record players were not as common, you would access things. Uh, through the library and now like you access it through your phone and there is like no necessity to go for a library for that but I think there is like this huge opportunity which kind of like opens up that you can install a really really good sound system in the library one that like of a quality which someone can't have uh, at their home right and library becomes this like perfect space uh, to be to be the venue uh, uh, for the recorded uh, music, right? And for the question about library as an event, 
that's about what I said earlier, I'm more and more coming to the conclusion that library is the ideal of the library, right? It's not library, no matter how, like how you assemble objects, books, tables, records, people, right? You can like any element of the library that you can name, if you put them all together, you can still like, you know, books, public access, any books can be, any book can be read. It also is a description of a bookstore. It doesn't make uh, a library, you know what I mean? Or like a storage or like whatever else. So the idea is, and like, the thing about the silent uh, uh, libraries, right? I think it does have its own use, for sure, uh, which has to do that uh, library space is about uh, um, is about conditioning attention in a certain way, right? And the silence thing is about being like uninterrupted in whatever is your thought process. And I think it's a absolutely like legit way of doing libraries. What I'm saying, it's not the only possible way to do that, uh, to do it. And it doesn't have to be uh, so rigid, right? And if you play music in the library, I think it again renders attention in a different way to when you play music in a different venue or when you play music, like, yeah. In... But you wouldn't go, like, if you have to write your dissertation, you wouldn't go to a library which plays electronic music. Um... But then, for instance, what I observed when I did, like, music events, like, many, many times, that library as a space, it's somehow, it's, it's kind of like an extremely comforting space because I saw many times and like it's a friend of mine who observed this, we were doing some event, some people showed up and like some people were chatting in the group and they knew each other and someone came and they either didn't know anyone or they, they were waiting for their friends to come in and they like picked up a book. And it's like very simple move, which all of a sudden like dissolves all the like- All, all the social pressure all social pressure, right? Just like in a very simple, uh, uh, simple move. That is uh, so true. And, and, the, and here's this other point, which is when we talk about access to information, right? Uh, I think before libraries used to have way more pressure in terms of like being this space of access to knowledge and information, right? And now we have like a plethora of other different tools to like access information. And then somehow what I feel what happened, right? Uh, I, I think that it relieved a lot of weight from the shoulders of libraries. And we now sit at the point where libraries kind of like need to recognize this new freedom and what they can do with what they do. And uh, to me, essentially space, libraries having space is a key fundamental uh, moment, right? Yeah. And the question of what can happen in that space can be opened up. Um, when you talk about space and the importance of space, maybe it's the right moment to ask you about that move from Kiev to London and what that did to, to Biblioteca and what that did to your idea of library. Has it changed it? Has it given it another layer that perhaps you're still trying to understand? I think it definitely did. It definitely did where in Kiev, the intention was um, to have a collection of material which is otherwise does not exist anywhere. But then also, yeah, have events around it and like have the community thing uh, uh, 
uh, around it. And I think those two things, they did stay like the collection of books and like the community aspect of it did definitely stay. Uh, but I think what has shifted because in here, Biblioteca exists alongside other libraries and other libraries potentially with, not potentially, I know there are libraries with really good collections, right? And I don't know, really weak public program or like the way, the way you literally like access them and like there are many collections which you can't really browse uh, uh, freely. And then, then there is also this, in the UK what's going on, there is like a shrinkage of funding across the board for libraries. There was some article lately I read and the, and the headline was the library, like the public library funding dropped by 17% while library attendance increased by 60%, right? Uh, I think it has to do like a bit because it's like post pandemic and like we're coming out, uh, but still uh, the demand for libraries has increased which kind of like brings this like really paradoxical economy that demand like uh, the, the with decrease of funding for these spaces that actually use increases, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, move, the move actually came quite unexpectedly. We had this in between moment because after Art Center we were in, uh, in an actual nightclub for uh, for like under a year, we had a room in the nightclub. Uh, okay. But the nightclub, uh, but then the nightclub closed as well. And was that in Kiev or in London? Sorry, it was in Kiev. It was in Kiev. So everything went into storage for a little bit, and then. Um, so wait, the the biblioteca was in the nightclub. Yeah, I mean, not in the main. The, not in the main. Uh, uh, space not in the main space but yeah there was this like room downstairs which was the reading room you would just you know go on a saturday at sort of 3 a.m you would just go down for some for some events we would like all keep it open late but uh, yeah not always not always usually like the it would be different hours uh, but yeah it was it was an interesting connection to be uh, to be in a nightclub uh, but it was it was like you know it was like the underground kind of club there is this set like there's this former uh, textile factory in Kiev which is I think occupied by they change sometimes but it's basically where the whole underground scene goes to dance uh, yeah and we, and we were there for some time yeah and then it went then the club closed the biblioteca went into storage and uh, I met a friend of mine, uh, Nina Ulfsak. Uh, she's, uh, she's a curator and uh, she also ran this like really cool project called Galerina. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, anyway, it's like the whole different. Anyway, like we're like chatting with her and she said uh, like, have you ever thought about like opening uh, opening a library uh, in London and I said like yeah maybe in a couple of years time and then literally two weeks later she phones me up and she says she she works for this gallery called Arcadia Nisa they used to have a space in Peckham now they're central and they were looking for someone to overtake the space uh, in Peckham and this is how this is how our, our Peckham space uh, we moved in 2020. There are some books still in storage in Kiev, but it's just like, uh, yeah, probably I need to pick them up. So there is, uh, so there, there probably you should, and presumably a lot of the books are by Ukrainian artists, photographers. Some of them, mm -hmm. some of them. Majority of the collection uh, has been like put together collecting in uh, London and Paris on like various book fairs and bookshops. That's one stream of books. Um, then, then uh, uh, yeah, of course we do have some 
Ukrainian like artists, but uh, obviously the publishing scene in there is relatively small. Some good stuff is happening, but it's relatively quite small. Uh, that's one source of books. Then the other collection we have, uh, Valus, who's uh, one of my partners uh, at Biblioteca, he he was he is also part of this project called Photobook Show UK. They did basically over ten years of photography books exhibitions around the world, and their model was they would like do an open call for artists to send their publications, and then they would do an exhibition with it. And with some with some of them, uh, it's like you know someone sent them a dummy copy, then they came to a publisher, the book got published. Then it went out of print, became rare, and we have a dummy copy of that. Okay. So that's another big chunk of collection. And they, those books, they come from around the world, right? And then in 20, yeah, basically a few years ago, I met this guy called Oliver Griffin. He's also an artist and he publishes books. And he's really, really well connected with the whole art book world because he publishes things himself. He was a part of this collective called uh, Artist Books Cooperative. And I don't know like how, but he he's us <laughs> some magic of like boxes of books just appearing, but it's also surprising how like people are- Appearing out of nowhere. Yeah, but people are extremely keen to donate books to the library and uh, and art like some artists they actually want their work to be in our collection because it's good for them uh, to have this type of platform and also like be part of this narrative and part of this uh, collection and then it's good for us to have the work right and it's good for everyone who's coming to see. It. Uh, uh, so yeah, the answer is yes, we do have some books on Ukrainian artists and art, uh, but it's not, our, it's not our focus. I think our focus is rather the uh, contemporary publishing scene internationally. I'd, I'd just quite like to explore a little bit, and I'll let you go soon, but I'd like to explore, <laughs> is Biblioteca in any Biblioteca or library? I, I don't mean Biblioteca, but maybe also Biblioteca. Well, where does the curation come into the play? I, I, you don't know, when I first looked at your website, it was really nice. You say, please send us your books, you know, if you're an artist and you're publishing a book, or we'll have it. But is there an element of curation? I think it's about what kind of people this place attracts, right? And about like sending books is basically about putting trust into our community. Curation, I think there is more like where does it depends on like how you approach it, right? And I think I, I think the way we do it is not like you know, we did this event called uh, uh, Book Fraser uh, at the ICA. Uh, where we basically we did a party with free entry, but you need to donate a book for Biblioteca. And the only requirement for the book we put in there, that it can be a book with only images or only text or anywhere in between those two extremes. But the one criteria should be it's the book that you like, right? It doesn't have to be... Uh, like expensive or anything, right? It, it needs to be something that you like. And surprisingly, people brought some really, really amazing stuff, right? Um, so on the curation side, so yeah, there is, there is one part of the curatorial project, which is the book collection, right? And I think the way it kind of works is, we have a list of publishers of interest, right? And we have a community of artists around the project. And it's about the, the library being, just by being within this infrastructure and within this network, we kind of like put trust in our network saying that like whatever comes through 
these challenges is mm -hmm. of interest to us. And surprisingly, like things of really good uh, quality uh, come up through that. So that's one element. But then the other element about the curation of uh, public program, right? Which again, I think one thing that project managed to do really successfully is to attract people who kind of like understand the concept without too much explanation and who brought, uh, who brought their things, right? And it's about this like, and when, when we talk about the community, it's not about like, you know, like it's like heavily overused world today, but basically what community means, it means friends and friends of friends of friends and friends of friends of friends of friends, of friends right? And, and the idea, the openness element right, is not necessarily about being uh, open randomly to everyone, which is, yeah, which can be part of it, and, like, which is also sometimes nice when someone like randomly wanders in, right? But it more has to do that anyone, uh, that there is like no, so it's not, it's not, uh, you see, because, there is this element if you do like friends and friends of friends, right? It can be become become a private club, right? And the idea of it being public is precisely in, in that is that it's this like extended field where like library is the gravity point for the for for the community to come uh, uh, together, where people don't feel intimidated uh, to enter, and apparently. I think there are some studies that libraries are really good at that, just by somehow by the position which libraries already have in the world today. They appear to people extremely inviting and like people can relate to it uh, uh, quite easily, right? Well, by name, as you said. Yeah. So you're escaping my question quite well, so I'm going to reframe it. How is Biblioteca categorized? How do you categorize books? Uh, we don't. It's chaotic. It's chaos, right? At the beginning, we like we had this like array. Seriously? Seriously, yes. No, like letters, names of artists. No. No. It's like, okay. Okay. Names. Roughly, roughly, I think it's a mix of things, right? Uh, Part of like like and, it, and it's a, it's a good it's a, it's essentially like a good uh, 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 it's a good question so like part of it like people ask do you have a catalog right and the answer is no and uh, no. <laughs> you don't have a catalog no we don't you don't have a list of all the books that you have yes because at some point the speed at which we were acquiring books overtook the capacity. I mean, you're really challenging what a library is, but go go ahead. No, but no, I'm not. It's important thing to mention, right? I'm not attacking any of this, right? And I'm not saying that any existing established library practice should change to what Biblioteca does. No, how we categorize? So, like, yeah, at the beginning we had this thing where, like, we had a few shelves to the right where we decided that we're gonna keep the whole photo book show. Uh, collection because it's like it's but okay uh, how we do categorize one thing we try to do whenever we acquire an entire collection of books or like uh, magazines which happens sometimes we try to keep those things together right if it's been like collected in certain way before and came in as a collection we try to keep it in the same like composed in the same way order no order, but like in the same bunch, right? If like we have this like 10 boxes of books that arrived, and they like sit on the shelves more or less together. But yeah, some of it is like the uh, Abby Warburg's uh, Law of the Good Neighbor, where things are kind of like put together by potentially like being, uh, being like of similar subject, right? 
but then yeah a big part of it is uh, is basically being chaotic and it's it's i think being chaotic in a library right because there is this like you know people enter the library they pull things out right and then they're put back in a different order which is in some in some way it's a trace of people who've been in in it and like where the change of the order of books is basically a record of what uh of that th th this interaction has happened right um but a big big part of it has basically to do i would love to have a qualified librarian who would like sit down and like list uh, all of these things but it's the question of the uh, prioritizing your resources right mm -hmm. but that's interesting because then i understand yes prioritizing resources it it goes back to the initial point that you were making about coming to library with an intuition and so it's interesting that it's the intuitive uh, approach comes into how biblioteca is organized which means it isn't organized or it's evolving mm. in some way and, but, and now when you say well if we had enough resources and there is a qualified librarian who's going to really go through it and look at it i would then question whether what would then be the way of organizing the book is it or is it is it merely just the listing or, or just understanding what you have uh, rather than maybe putting it in a specific order so yes definitely definitely and then spatially from the existing practices uh the example that like appeals the most to me is the sit and work library in switzerland where they have these shelves and they put this scanner uh over the shelves which like every day in the evening it goes over the entire shelves and scans where like each book sits and then updates the catalog. So if you find things on the, so like you can mix things on the shelves, whichever way you like. And then if you find them on the catalog, the, the catalog is gonna give you the right location. Which like, you see the whole question of categories in libraries apparently is extremely, uh, uh, extremely problematic because uh there is this book by Louisa Adler called Cruising the Library, where she basically she writes about the Delta collection in the Library of Congress, which is the closed collection, where like only which you can access only by special uh um permission. And she says, and, and but basically she traces into how by what material has been put into that uh, 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 collection, right? She traces how it influenced, for instance, homophobic laws, because something like has entered their realm in which it is like labeled as obscene. Something that like uh, the, the social consensus today is no longer that, right? Uh, but yeah, she basically she does this like really thorough analysis of the relationship between the history of libraries and categories of libraries and the history of sexuality and how what is the relationship between uh, uh, between those two. So whenever whenever you put this like division line of like naming something, it's it, it, you simultaneously like I know. On the one hand, I understand why these categories are created in the first place. I think the intention is to make the navigation easier and like make it make it make things easier to find on the one hand, but then on the other hand, it simultaneously uh, uh, labels things, right? And that's actually that's actually a really good like in both library and archival practice it's and that's also like something that uh, uh AI, AI archives does as well so like whenever you have like an existing list of categories right which has been updated 
to uh, I don't know, like make make things more inclusive or like recognize some voices which hasn't been like recognized mm -hmm. before. The previous version of the catalog is archived as well, right? Because the the struggle like the catalog entries they also identify the way we saw things in the past, and uh, it becomes an archival record uh, itself. Um, but to me, to me, it's like maybe maybe to come back to to biblioteca and like why why not so much order in all of this um, because it's about really prioritizing the physical browsing experience, right? And it's not, uh, uh, I don't see it necessarily as, um, you know, challenging necessarily of any existing convention. It's just like exploring the possibility of shift of emphasis from like the organized to chaotic. And it's like, it's, it's basically, you know, no matter how organized libraries are, the individual experience of the library is always super chaotic. You never know, you never know what you're gonna encounter. You never know like how things, uh, how things uh, uh, gonna go. And I think it's like in part libraries, many times they try to attend, they attempted to order this like individual journey through a library, right? Because the library itself is order, right? And I think what Biblioteca tries to do is to embra embrace this chaos and like embrace this uh, like free wandering uh, uh, exploration. What you're saying really makes sense because what perhaps needs to happen is that library needs to rewrite the terms of engagement with that person that comes in. So, you know, usually people go in to go to a very specific book. Mm. And they sort of go in and it's about, it's about being as quick mm. journey to that specific book mm. or a very specific topic that's just going to find itself with all this digital and technology that's associated with navigating the library. That's one specific preference. Don't you do it on the internet now? And even if you find it in the library, right? You do it online. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I feel like, uh, um, but, that, but that's, that's what I'm trying to emphasize. And, it, it, and it's about like actually looking at the experience of going to the library in itself, not for a particular end, but what it actually means uh, to be in the library and how does library render the individual thought process and like how does it render the interaction between people being in the library where the where the destination is not the book where destination is the library which has books right uh, it's but i think i think it's like 